Some of you may know that we use something called a lectionary to um, set for us the Bible readings that we use each Sunday throughout the year, and they come in a cycle, so over the course of three or four years, it gets us through a, maybe a broader variety of readings, and if it were left to the pastors to pick the themes and set them, we might pick a narrower selection, picking those things that we like to preach and avoiding the ones that are challenging for us, because there are many that are challenging. Here at Trinity, we use a lectionary called the Narrative Lectionary that begins in September in Genesis, and then it follows. This actually doesn't make sense. This is, makes sense to me. So from your perspective, we begin in September in Genesis, follow the arc of the Old Testament until Christmas, and then we pick up a gospel until we end up in the early church around um, Pentecost in the spring. And one of the blessings of the Narrative Lectionary is that they have a year for the Gospel of John, which the Revised Common Lectionary does not. The Gospel of John is a remarkable gospel, and we will be in John from now until into the spring, and that's a good, good thing. So our reading this morning comes from the first chapter of John. The next day, John the Baptist was standing with two of his disciples, and as he watched Jesus walk by, he exclaimed, Look, here is the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. When Jesus turned and saw them following, he said to them, What are you looking for? They said to him, Rabbi, which translated means teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, Come and see. They came and saw where he was staying, and they remained with him that day. It was about four o'clock in the afternoon. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his brother Simon and said to him, We found the Messiah, which is translated anointed. He brought Simon to Jesus, who looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You are to be called Cephas, which is translated Peter. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him about whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus, son of Joseph from Nazareth. Nathanael said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, come and see. When Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him, he said of him, Here is truly an Israelite in which there is no deceit. Nathanael asked him, Where did you get to know me? Jesus answered, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. Nathanael replied, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus answered, do you believe because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Very truly I tell you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Some years ago, this is reflection number one, some years ago, the senior pastor I worked with asked me to take on the confirmation program at our church. I was excited to be asked about it because I love working with middle schoolers. Because we wanted to refresh the program, the youth director and I interviewed pastors, including Pastor Tim Colpett, who was at Mount Olivet at the time, interviewed pastors and youth directors and lay leaders at churches that we felt had vibrant confirmation programs. Then we also went down to the local middle school to speak with a peer teacher because we were curious about effective methods for teaching material that we actually want the kids to learn. And this teacher shared a few strategies and had some really cool things for us to try. But the most profound thing she said to us was this. The single most important aspect of any kind of teaching is relationship relationship, relationship. 
And while that's not surprising to those of you who are teachers, in an era that is burdened by standardized test scores, frankly, it delighted me that ultimately learning still comes down to relationship. Reflection number two. It's no secret that Trinity has had some conflict in our past, and it's no secret that as a result, some folks understandably decided to leave the congregation. What's amazing to me about churches that, has, that, that have been through conflict is that more people don't leave. I'm aware of some congregations that have been through some really, really bad stuff, and still people hang in there sharing their time and their talent and their treasure. Why? Relationship, relationship, relationship. In a city like Stillwater or a big metro area, there are countless other churches to choose from. Even in small towns, people often have at least one or two other cho choices about where to attend if things go bad in their own congregation. But those churches might, as wonderful as they may be, might not include the people with whom we raised our children, the couples from our evening Bible study, the long-time friends from our women's circle, that nice lady who taught our special needs child in Sunday school, or the patient confirmation mentor who took a wayward teenager under his wing. Things might get tough sometimes, but as tough as it gets, it's tougher still to find an enduring substitute for relationships. Reflection number three. The Gospel of John is many things, many marvelous things. It is mystical, literary, metaphorical, lush, detailed, and awesome. There are gorgeous themes that weave their way through this Gospel. And today we're going to focus on two of them. One is a literary device that John uses throughout the Gospel. And the other is the theme of, say it with me, relationship, relationship, relationship. First, the device. John the Gospel writer, as opposed to John the Baptist, uses something that we might call tell and show. It works something like this. John the Baptist or Jesus will explain to the disciples or the other characters something that they're going to see. And then the disciples see what has been explained to them. And the result is belief. For example, in today's story, and this gives you a sneak preview on next Sunday, in today's story, both John the Baptist and Jesus tell the disciples that Jesus is something special, something other, the Lamb of God, the Son of Man. The next thing the disciples are going to see is Jesus turning water into wine and not just wine, but really good wine, confirming that Jesus is indeed something special, something other. The result is that the disciples would believe. Those who hadn't been told anything ahead of the wedding were either confused or not even in the know about what happens there. But when the disciples see Jesus turn water into wine, they see what they've been told and they become believers. This is going to happen over and over again throughout the Gospel of John. And I point it out to you because not only is it an important theme, but because the whole first chapter of John is telling us what we're going to see in the next 20 chapters. In the next 20 chapters, we will see and taste and smell the Word made flesh. We will see what it means to be the Lamb of God. We will see what it looks like to be the Son of God. And seeing what we have been told builds our faith. And faith brings us back to relationship, relationship, relationship. But first, a wee bit of background on the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John is written to affirm the Messiahship of Jesus. There was a great deal of vigorous conflict with Jesus and within the Jewish community over this issue. The religious leaders objected to Jesus' claim to be the Son of God, and they objected to the claim that he had a special relationship with God. This was, for them, the very worst kind of heresy. 
But as we make our way through the Gospel of John, we need to remind ourselves over and over again that we not paint the Jews, especially those we meet in the Gospels, with a broad negative brush. This resistance to Jesus was, in part, resisting his challenge to the status quo, yes. But this resistance to Jesus was also based on a deep fidelity to the God of Israel and to the expectation of a very particular kind of Messiah. These religious leaders are largely doing their best to be faithful and to protect the people in their care. They faced a challenge that modern religious leaders still face. How do we balance faithfulness with the possibility that God might be speaking to us in a new way? And how do we prevent faithfulness, honest faithfulness, from becoming more about institutional survival than it is about the good news of God made flesh? It's not uncommon at all for congregations to get more worked up over worship styles than they do about the importance of inviting others to come and see the Jesus that we meet in that worship style. It's not uncommon at all for pastors and council, councils to be more confer, concerned with meeting the budget than with exploring imaginative ways to introduce new people to this God made flesh. The Gospel of John was written into just such a reality where efforts at faithfulness, deep faithfulness, resulted in deep divisions between those who heard the good news and those who rejected the good news and where efforts to be faithful meant that some people never even heard the good news in the first place. We are blessed in this time and in this place with another chance to be transformed believers captivated by Jesus. We have a new chance every day to come and see, to be in relationship with this unconventional Messiah and the God that we meet in him. And so to John's theme of relationship. In the beginning of our story, when Andrew asks Jesus where he is staying, in the Greek what he is actually asking him is, where are you abiding? To abide means to be truly and deeply present. To abide carries a sense of commitment and partnership that transcends simply being someone's house guest. When Jesus responds to Andrew with, come and see, he is not only answering Andrew's question, but more importantly, Jesus is affirming that the Lamb of God is not just present, but abiding among them, deeply present. Wow. Jesus' simple gesture of showing Andrew where he is staying is God saying to Andrew, yes, I am here with you. Wow. Now remember I said that the whole first chapter of John is the tell to the next 20 chapters that will be the show. This is a summary of what the first chapter is telling us. Jesus is going to get into deep and deadly trouble with the religious and political leaders because of his claim to a special relationship with God. Jesus is also going to show the disciples and us that Jesus isn't the only one with a special relationship with God. The word made flesh brings us into that relationship as well through loaves and light and miraculous jars of really good wine. At the very end of our reading, Jesus tells Nathanael that he will see angels ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. The next 20 chapters will show us that Jesus himself is not only God dwelling among us, but Jesus is the stairway to heaven. Jesus is the pathway to God, the gate the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus draws us into relationship with God by becoming flesh and making us children of God. Now, to be a child of God is not just a sweet sentiment. It is a powerful claim on real, authentic relationship with our Creator. 
It is a commitment made by the God in flesh that you belong, that you matter, that you are claimed. The door to this relationship is never closed. And I'm going to say that again. The door to this relationship is never closed. Some of us have grown up knowing that we belong to and are beloved by God. Others of us came to that knowledge later in life. And some of us are still trying to sort it all out. In fact, no matter when you learn God loved you, we're still trying to sort it all out. And still there are many that haven't heard this news. Many who are waiting for someone to say, come and see. So often we who know this good news remain silent because we're afraid we can't make a sound theological explanation of what happened to Thalen in her baptism today. We can't explain what we believe. We're paralyzed because our Bible knowledge feels too thin and we don't quite understand atonement theory. Really. Who understands atonement theory? But here's the thing. We cannot hope to explain what simply has to be experienced. God dwelling here with us, in us, among us. God listening as we pray and as we sing and worship. God showing up in bread and wine and in water. God electrifying a simple handshake with a peace that passes all understanding. God inviting us into relationship through ordinary flesh. We will dwell in the Gospel of John from now through Easter. So come, taste, see, touch, smell, hear that the Lord is good and wants to be in relationship, relationship, relationship with you. Amen.